Well, that that um, that was the practice that kept us alive, helped us to survive. And uh, the miracle of mindfulness was written for our social workers first in Vietnam because they were living in a situation where the danger of um, of dying so, uh, is there uh, was there every day. So out of compassion, out of willingness to help them <coughs> to continue uh, their work, well, the mark of mindfulness was written as a manual practice. And after that, um, <coughs> many friends in the West, they think that it is helpful for, for them, so we allow it to be translated into English and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and the... I know that that the, the elements of mindfulness, the way you describe it, are are in traditional Buddhism, in the teachings of the Buddha. But but you do seem to have placed a very special kind of emphasis and interpretation on on breathing and and also what is the word what is the Vietnamese word that you're translating as mindfulness? Um, what are the connotations um, of that? I wonder. Chánh niệm, chánh niệm. It means um, true mindfulness. And niệm means um, your mind fully present in the here and the now. Okay. And uh, mindfulness is the, at the heart of Buddhist meditation. <clears throat> because with mindfulness, you'll be concentrated. And mindfulness and concentration help you to see things and to, um, to touch things more deeply so that you may understand the true nature of what is there. And that uh, kind of uh, understanding will set you free from from your wrong perceptions and from from the uh, afflictions that come from your wrong perceptions. What, what have you done with this concept, though, that that is different? I mean, how did you interpret it or apply it differently that it had such a an impact? Um. Your mindfulness is a an art of living. <clears throat> when you are mindful, you are fully alive, you are fully present. You can get in touch with the wonders of life that can nourish you and heal you. And uh, you are stronger, you are more solid in order to uh, to handle the suffering inside of you and around you. Uh, when you, uh, you are mindful, you can uh, recognize, embrace, and handle the pain, the sorrow in you and around you to bring a relief. And if you uh, continue with uh, concentration and uh, insight, you'll be able to uh, transform the suffering inside and help uh, transform the suffering around you. And, you know, this word miracle is, is on the surface, is quite intriguing when, when what you're describing is so organic. I mean, it, it's, it's getting in touch with with your breath, uh, first of all, um, is is does that word or does this phrase the miracle of mindfulness does that come out of out of your Buddhist training or was that um, a phrase that came to you? Mm. It is in my heart when I uh, <coughs> I uh, I use it <coughs> because when you when you t- uh, you breathe in your mind comes back to your body. And then uh, you fully, you become fully aware that you are alive, Mm -hmm. that uh, you are a miracle, and everything you touch could be a miracle. The orange in your hand, uh, the blue sky, uh, the face of a child, everything becomes a wonder. And in fact, there are wonders of life that are available in the here and the now. And uh, you need to breathe mindfully in and out in order to be fully present and to get in touch with all these things. And that is a miracle. To breathe in and to know that you are alive. And uh, to be alive is already a miracle. The, the largest miracle. And to be alive and to be walking on this beautiful planet is a miracle. And then when you are a miracle, and if you, if, uh, if you get in touch with other things, other miracles, well, life becomes a miracle. 
and that's why you can you can live the miracles of life in every moment and also the suffering that you encounter are also miracles because um, uh, you understand the nature of the suffering you know the role of suffering uh, that suffering play in in life and you are not trying to run away from suffering anymore and you know how to um, how to make use of suffering in order to uh, build uh, peace and happiness. It's like uh, growing uh, lotus flowers. You cannot grow lotus flowers on marble. You have to grow them on, on the mud. Hmm. Without the mud, you cannot have a lotus flower. Without suffering, uh, you, can, you, can, you have no ways in order to learn how to, uh, to be understanding and compassion. So uh, the element suffering helps, plays a, a role in the cultivating, um, cultivation of uh, understanding and compassion. That's why my definition of uh, the kingdom of God is not a place where suffering is not, where there is no suffering. The kingdom of God? Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, I would not like to go to a place where there is no suffering. I could not like to send my children to a place where there is no suffering because uh, in such a place they have no way to learn how to be understanding and compassionate. And uh, the kingdom of God is a place where there is understanding and compassion mm -hmm. and therefore suffering should exist. Like uh, in a place where there are lotus flowers, there must be mud. And that's that's quite different from some religious perspectives, which would say that the kingdom of God is a place where we've transcended suffering or moved beyond it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's also naive to think that uh, there is the right without the left, the above without the below, uh, the good without the evil. And um, <clears throat> suffering and happiness, they are both organic. Hmm like uh, flour and garbage. <clears throat> if um, if um, the flour is on her way to become a piece of garbage, and the garbage can be on her way to become to becoming a flower, right. that is why you are not afraid of uh, <clears throat> the garbage. Uh, you know how to handle the garbage so that flowers can be uh, created. And that is all. There's no attempt to run away from suffering. Uh, you handle the suffering in such a way in order to create uh, well-being and happiness. I, I think. Uh, I think um, we have suffered a lot uh, during the 20th, 20th century. We have created a lot of uh, yeah. garbage. Uh, it's, uh, there was a lot of violence and hatred and separation, and uh, we have. We, we have not um, handled, we don't know how to handle the, the garbage that we have created. If we had, and then we would have a chance to create uh, a new century for peace. That is why now it's very important for us to learn how to, tra to transform the garbage we have uh, created into flowers. So I look at, um, at the violence that marked the world in the period when you were a young monk. Um, uh, there was, there were, there was the Cold War. I mean, there was a certain kind of violence and hostility. Um, a lot of that has changed, has gone away. A lot of the of the terrible threats and the the sources of of the worst fighting, and now in its place we have new kinds of wars and new kinds of enemies. I'd be really interested in as you look at this period of your lifetime. You know. Is there any qualitative difference between the violence that we have now and the violence that we had then? Is there anything like progress happening? Um, or is it the same pattern that repeats itself? Uh, you are right. It's the same patterns that, uh, the pattern that repeats itself. And does that make you despair? Uh, no, because uh, <clears throat> I noticed that there are people who are capable of understanding that who have enough uh, enlightenment, and if uh, only they come together and uh, offer their light and show us the way, there is a chance for transformation and healing. 
And you know, in a, in a retreat like this, you've gathered around you hundreds of people who are who are offering themselves up as individuals to this kind of training and and mindfulness. And and there's you know you're not just talking about peace here. There's a sense of peace. But then the cynical question would be. Um, can these individuals make a difference? You know, we, it seems like we live in an age of collective violence, collective terror, and uh, collective acts of, of of retribution. So, how do you see the effect of this work that you do, um, and even of individuals really cultivating compassion? Well, peace always uh, begins with yourself as an individual. And uh, as an individual, you might help uh, building a community of peace. That's what we try to do. And when your community um, of a few hundred people know the, know the, knows the practice of peace and brotherhood, and then you can become the refuge for many others who come to you and, uh, and, uh, and profit from the practice of peace and brotherhood. And then they will join you, and the community uh, get larger and larger all the time. And the practice of peace and brotherhood will be offered to many other people. That is what is going on. And you experience that to be Yes, happening. because when I came to the West, I was all alone. And uh, I was aware that I had to build a community. And there was no Buddhist at all um, <clears throat> at that time. So I work with uh, uh, non-Buddhist people, and uh, I um, suggest the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking, mindful sitting, and uh, slowly we build uh, a community of practice that uh, has an international uh, nature. And now we have uh, many hundreds of uh, communities like that in Europe, in America, in Asia. And uh, each community offers the same kind of practice uh, to the people where they live. We even have uh, communities in the Middle East, uh, consisting of uh, Israelis and uh, Palestinians. Right, I know. So that you'd seen you were bringing Israelis and Palestinians together at Plum Village. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there's been a a change in the way you spend your energy, maybe as a way to put it, from this this social activism on a grand scale and political activism in your earlier life, and that now it seems to be that you're focusing on groups of people who are facing challenges of violence. I mean, I see you in this year in the United States, you're meeting with members of Congress and Hollywood filmmakers and law enforcement officers. Um... I mean, does that represent a new way of your thinking about about how to, what the problems are and how to change them in our world? You know, we still continue the work we, uh, we, we have done in the past. We continue to uh, work to bring relief to uh, refugees, orphans, and uh, people who suffer um, a little bit everywhere. Because uh, doing so, we nourish the awareness that there are suffering people everywhere, and that help us uh, to maintain our compassion and understanding, not to be, not being cut off from uh, uh, the world. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, since uh, we have uh, more friends in the realms of uh, business, uh, on politics, uh, uh, health, uh, professionals. Um, uh, they help us bring the practice into these uh, realms. Okay. Do you, is your teaching any different if you're speaking to members of Congress, or you're speaking to Hollywood filmmakers, or you're speaking to law enforcement officers? The practice would be the same, but you have to understand uh, the difficulty, the suffering, the aspiration of uh, different group of people in order to offer um, the teaching, the practice in a way that can be understood easily and received easily and applied easily. And how do you how do you do that? Is that something you discern when you come together with that group? Um, we need friends to show us 
how uh, a certain group of people live their life, uh, what kind of uh, suffering and difficulties they encounter in their life, so that we can understand. And after that, only after that, we could uh, offer the appropriate teaching and practice. That is why we continue to learn every day mm-hmm. with our practice and sharing. And it is intriguing that you're meeting with members of Congress. Um, some of the things you've said about the war on terror, I mean, you've used the word, you used the word forgiveness right away, and I, I don't think that was a word that was anywhere in our public discourse in this country. Um, but I also heard you this morning when you were speaking with the group talking about the responsibility of, of everyone for, also for policies, uh, global policies. It's, say some more about that, about how individuals, what, what role individuals have to play even in something like the war on terror from, from your perspective? Um, the individual has to wake up to the fact that uh, violence cannot end violence. That uh, only understanding and compassion can neutralize violence. Because with uh, uh, the practice of loving um, speech and compassionate listening, we can begin to understand people and help people to remove the wrong perceptions in them because these wrong perceptions are at the foundation of their anger, their fear, their violence, their hate. And uh, listen deeply. You might be able to remove the wrong perception you have in within yourself concerning you and concerning them. So the basic practice in order to remove uh, terrorism and war is the practice of removing wrong perceptions and that cannot be done with the bombs and the guns. And uh, it is very important that our political leaders realize that and apply the techniques of uh, communication. We live in a, in a time when we have a very sophisticated uh, means for communication, but communication become very difficult, has become very difficult between uh, individuals and groups of uh, people. <laughs> A father cannot talk to a son, mother cannot talk to a daughter, and uh, maybe husband cannot talk to a wife, and Israelis cannot talk to Palestinians, and Hin- Hindus cannot uh, talk to uh, Muslims. And that is why we have war, we have uh, violence. That is why restoring communication is the basic work for peace. And our political and our uh, spiritual leaders have to focus our, their energy uh, on this matter. But I think some would say, people in positions of power would say that they simply can't wait for that communication to happen or for that change to take place, that they also have to act now. If. Uh, if uh, they can, cannot communicate with themselves, if they cannot communicate with uh, members of their family, if they cannot communicate with um, people in their own country, um, they have no understanding that will serve the base for right action. And they will make a lot of mistakes. Mm. The individual has to has to has to practice in order to get the kind of right insight that will help him or her um, to intervene into um, society. Uh, the war of Iraq, for instance, was started with the conviction that there are weapons for mass destruction in Iraq. And many Americans supported that, supported the war on that kind of conviction. They believed their government, that they believed their president. And now it turns out that uh, such a weapon have not been found. This is a very challenging issue concerning the ethics of a whole country. Uh, it makes people lose faith in America 
and Americans losing faith in their own uh, leadership is very serious. Um, and and now uh, America seems to be caught in Iraq, and it seems that the United States of America have to occupy the country for a long time. And every day there may be uh, American young young men and young women die in Iraq. And I think uh, there should be a kind of awakening in America that is uh, strong enough to change the course of action. I, I think that uh, the United States of America should invest into the United Nations and help it to become a true body of peacekeeping. There are the other countries that are ready to collaborate in order to, to do such a thing. And then when the United Nations has become a true body of uh, peacekeeping, and then America can say something like, uh, well, uh, we are sorry that we have not found any uh, weapon from mass destruction in Iraq, but we have helped somehow to, uh, to remove an unpopular regime there. Now we would like to handle the whole situation to the United Nations uh, so that uh, we become only one member of the United Nations helping Iraq to rebuild itself. That is the, the kind of thing that America can do in order to get out uh, with, uh, with, um, with um, the uh, uh, appreciation mm -hmm. of, uh, of the world and to, uh, and, and, and to set right again um, what, what was not uh, right. Um, I'm wondering if... Um you know, by way of, of bringing this back to you and your and the practice and how you know the practice, if you would read um, this poem for warmth and and talk about what that <coughs> how you think about anger and how one lives with anger. And, and, you know, I want to say about being with you. It's clear that you are a very passionate person, and that that um, that being mindful doesn't take away all these emotions, right? These, these human emotions. Yeah, we have to remain uh, human yeah. mm. in order to be able to understand and to be compassionate. Uh, you have the right uh, to be angry, but you don't have the right not to practice in order to transform your anger. You have the right to make mistakes, but you don't have the right to continue making mistakes. You have to learn uh, from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. And that is a sense of uh, the meaning of civilization and progress. Would you say something about when you, the occasion for which you, on which you wrote this poem also? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I wrote this poem after I hear the news that uh, the city of Bente was bombed. And an American uh, army officer declared that uh, he had to destroy the town in order to save the town. It's very shocking for us. In fact, there were a number of guerrillas who came to the town and who used anti-aircraft gun to shoot. And because of that, uh, they bombarded the town and, uh, and killed so many civilians. I think it was, was it 1965 or something like that? Yeah, around that mm -hmm. uh, time. Okay. Tôi bưng mặt trong lòng hai bàn tay. Có phải để khóc đâu anh? Tôi bưng mặt để giữ cho ấm áp sự cô đơn. Hai bàn tay chở che, hai bàn tay nuôi dưỡng, hai bàn tay ngăn cản sự ra đi hờn dỗi của linh hồn. I hold my face between my hands. No, I am not crying. I hold my face between my hands to keep my loneliness warm. Two hands protecting, two hands nourishing, two hands to prevent me, to prevent my soul from leaving me in anger. That is the practice of uh, 
mindfulness called practice, uh, mindfulness of anger. When you when you notice that anger is coming up in you, you have to practice mindful breathing in order to generate the energy of mindfulness, in order to recognize your anger and embrace it tenderly, uh, so that you can bring relief into you and not to act and to say things that can destroy, that can be destructive. And uh, doing so, you can look deeply into the nature of your anger and know where it has come from. That practice helps us to realize that not, not only Vietnamese uh, civilians and, and uh, military were victims of the war, but also American men and women who came to Vietnam to kill and to be killed were also victims of the war. And the, the deep cause of the war is the kind of policy that was based on wrong perceptions. Because at that, at, of, that, of that time, America was uh, convinced that if uh, Vietnam has uh, became a communist country, that would be a threat for America. And the uh, United States of America sent uh, half a million of soldiers in Vietnam and invested a lot of uh, its energy and money into Vietnam. And why back in America there was poverty, social injustice, and so on. And then uh, um, the American forces uh, practice uh, uh, the policy of search and destroy. They thought that uh, to fight uh, the communists in South Vietnam is not enough. They have to go to Cambodia uh, to, to, to search and destroy the communists that are in Cambodia. And they went to North Vietnam and search for communists and bombard Vietnam. And there was one time they declared that they had to bombard uh, Vietnam into a stone age so that, yeah. uh, to bring it back to uh, the stone age. And yet, uh, with that mighty power, America did not succeed in, uh, in, in uh, destroying the communists. In fact, that policy created more communist and hatred in Vietnam. I think uh, the same thing might be true now in the, in, in, in the, in the, in Iraq. Uh, I'm not sure that America has, has um, diminished the number of terrorists and uh, make people uh, uh, believe more in America. I think the anti-American feeling is growing there. Mm -hmm. And uh, America has created more hatred, more uh, terrorists. And we have to wake up to that kind of truth because only a collective awakening can help us out of this situation. So, so here's the question that occurs to me again and again. These root causes are so simple in a way. Wrong perception. Yes. Poor communication. Yes. Anger that, that may have its place in human life, but then needs to be acted on mindfully in your language. Why is it so hard for human beings, and I think this is as true in a family as it is in global politics, to, to, to take these simple things seriously, these simple aspects of being human? I don't think uh, it is difficult. In the many retreats that we offer um, in Europe, in America, in, in many other countries, awakening, understanding, compassion, and reconciliation can take place after a few days of practice. Uh, people need uh, an opportunity mm -hmm. so that the seed of uh, compassion, understanding in them to be watered. And that is why uh, we are not uh, discouraged. We know that if there are more people uh, joining in the work of offering that opportunity, and then there will be a collective awakening. And we shall have enough uh, collective understanding and compassion uh, to help us out of this uh, uh, difficult situation. You know, I, I look at you and I, I also see that you view the world through the eyes of compassion, which is another term you use, and that I see the weight of that 
on you. I mean, that it, it is also a burden to to look at the world straight and to see suffering and to see the sources of suffering wherever you look. When you have compassion in your heart, you suffer much less. And you are in a situation to be and to do something to help other, others to suffer less. This is the truth. So to, to practice in such a way that bring compassion into your heart is a very important. A person without compassion cannot be a happy person. And compassion is something that, that is possible only when you have understanding. Understanding brings compassion. Understanding is compassion itself. When you understand the difficulties, the suffering, the despair of the other person, you don't hate him, you don't hate her anymore. And you are motivated by the desire to do something in order to help him or her uh, uh, transform the suffering inside. What would compassion look like towards a terrorist, let's say? The terrorist. They are victims of their wrong perceptions. They have wrong perceptions on themselves, and they have wrong perceptions on us. And uh, that does not mean that we do not have uh, wrong perceptions on us and on them. So the practice of communication, peaceful communication, can help them to remove the wrong perceptions on them and on us, and the wrong perceptions we have on us and on them. This is, a, this is the basic practice. This is the principle. And I hope that our political leaders understand this and take action right away to help us. And we as uh, citizens, we have to voice our concern uh, very strongly because we should support our political leaders because we have helped uh, elect them. We should not leave everything uh, to them. We should live our daily in such a way that we could have the time and the energy in order to, 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 to bring our light, our support to our political leaders. We, we should not hate our leaders. We should not be angry at our leaders. We should only support them and help them to see right in order to act right. Mm. I want to finish because I know Oh, I've taken a lot of your time. I, I want to ask you, um, just, this is from Fragrant Palm Leaves, which I know was a journal you wrote in, in the 1960s, but this is about Zen. Zen is not merely a system of thought. Zen infuses our whole being with the most pressing question we have. Um, what, are, what are your pressing questions at this point in, in your life? Mm, pressing Pressing question. Mm-hmm. One of the questions you work through in your practice, just personally, I wonder. Uh, I do not have any any uh, any question right now. My practice is to live in the here and the now, and uh, uh, it is a great happiness for you to be able to live and to do. Uh, uh, um, what you like to live and to do. Um, my practice is centered in the present moment. I know that if you know how to handle the present moment uh, right with, uh, with our best, and then that is about everything you can do for the future. Mm-hmm. That is why I'm at peace with myself. Uh, I take the time. I, I invest uh, one percent of my, one hundred percent of my body and my mind into hand in the present moment, and with that, I feel at peace with myself and with the world. Were you always able to do that? That's my practice every day, and that is very nourishing. And uh, there are friends who live around me, and who practice the same, and they are a great support uh, to me uh, in that respect also. And I wonder. Living that way and practicing that way, does forgish, forgiveness become instinctive? Do, does there become a point where you no longer react with anger, but, but immediately become compassionate and forgiving towards 
those things which would cause suffering. When you practice uh, looking at people with the eyes of compassion, that kind of uh, practice will become a good habit. And, uh, and you are capable of uh, looking uh, at the people in such a way that you can see the suffering, the difficulties. Uh, and uh, if you can see, and then compassion will naturally flow from your heart. It's for your sake, and that is for their sake also. Uh, if um, in the Lotus Sutra there is a wonderful uh, uh, five-word sentence, looking at living beings with the eyes of compassion, and that brings you happiness, that brings relief into the world. And this practice can be done by every one of us. I wonder if you would read me one more poem before we finish. And I was thinking of um, illusion transformed, and then just tell me what that says, what that means right now in the world. And this is po- this poem I, I wrote about um, 40 years ago or more. Horizons heavy eyelids, mountains leaning, seeking rest from earth below. At nightfall, grass and flowers perfume sleep. Illusion shift her veils, wind lift up her hands, red candle shimmer in the silver river of the sky. The hillside open doorway frames a falling star that rises the sacred woods in fire. Ten thousand lives are spinning, circling. Dreams illusion the moment of this night reveals this world reality. I wrote it um, in a night after I after I walk meditation in the in outside. Uh, it was a night um, full of uh, stars. And after the walk meditation, I went into my hermitage and stand uh, behind my window, and I saw a shooting star. And uh, that was the inspiration that brought about this uh, poem. Uh, I would like to read it in Vietnamese. Yeah. I have uh, put uh, this uh, poem in Vietnamese into uh, Mm, music. Hmm. Uh, sẽ chẳng không mày 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 xin người ta vô. Mí mắt chân trời mỏi, đầu núi nghiêng nghiêng tìm gối tựa. Đêm về thơm rất cỏ hoa, ảo hóa bàn tay rõ dậy ngân hà nến ngọc lung linh, khung cửa lưng đồi bỏ ngõ sao băng vụt chảy lời kinh. Vạn kiếp xoay quanh vòng mộng mị, đêm nay chợt thầy chân hình. Thank you. This is On Being's Unheard Cuts. I'm Krista Tippett. You're listening to my unedited conversation with the Zen master and poet Thich Nhat Hanh. I spoke with him on August 26, 2003, at a retreat in Green Lake, Wisconsin. This interview is included in our program, Brother Thai, a radio pilgrimage with Thich Nhat Hanh. Download the MP3 of the produced show at onbeing.org.